All right, good evening, everyone. Sego Ani Buju Ndio Wachea Kwe Kwe. As the mayor of the city of Kingston, I offer these words in the spirit of this gathering. Let us bring our good minds and hearts together as one to honor and celebrate these traditional lands as a gathering place of the original peoples and their ancestors who were entrusted to care for Mother Earth since time immemorial. It is with deep humility that we acknowledge and offer our gratitude for their contributions to this community, having respect for all as we share this space now and walk side by side into the future. Okay, we were just meeting in a Committee of the Whole closed meeting. Uh, we did discuss uh, a couple of items, one with respect to legal advice related to encampments, uh, and the second, affordable housing land acquisition. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Deputy Clerk, or Madam Acting Clerk, I will ask for a motion to rise with that reporting, please. Moved by Councillor Amos, seconded by Councillor Ridge, that Council rise from the Committee of the Whole closed meeting without reporting. All those in favour? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, um, we did already approve the uh, added at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, we did have uh, an amendment to a closed session item, uh, an amendment to a delegation, a withdrawal of a delegation, some miscellaneous business items, and a notice of motion. Uh, so, uh, moving on, are there any disclosures of potential pecuniary interest? Council Rich. Thank you, Your Worship. Through you, I, Gregory Ridge of the Corporation of the City of Kingston, declare my pecuniary interest in the matter of Clause 1, Report 24, for the following reason. As an employee of Queen's University, there may be a potential conflict of interest. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any other declarations of conflict of interest? Okay, uh, seeing none, we'll move on. We have no presentations this evening. We do have two delegations. Uh, so at this time, we'll move to our first delegation. We'll invite Linda Melnick, Executive Director of Athletics and Recreation from Queen's University, and Dwayne Parliament, Associate Director of Facilities and Operations of Queen University, to appear before Council to speak to Clause 1 of Report Number 24 from the CAO with respect to the request for extension of noise exemption, Queen's University Richardson Stadium. Um, just a note to our delegations that you have uh, five minutes, and then we will open up to questions from members of Council. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Patterson and members of Council. My name is Linda Melnick. I'm the Executive Director at Athletics and Recreation, and I'm joined by Dwayne Parliament, our Associate Director of Facilities and Operations. Thank you very much for inviting us here today. Council has received a detailed application of our noise bylaw exemption request for Richardson Stadium, and we are requesting that the exemption be renewed for the 2023 and 2024 calendar years with the same terms and conditions as in 2022. The format of this request provides Council with a total view of the maximum number of events planned for the year, including sporting events hosted by Queen's Community, uh, sorry, Queen's Athletics, community groups, or sport tourism events that may be coming to Kingston. This exemption will enable us to host community youth sporting events as well as provincial and national tournaments that will support tourism in Kingston more broadly. I am very pleased to say, um, or I'm pleased to say that the previous noise bylaw exemption was implemented successfully during the 2022 season with no formal written complaints about the use of amplified music during games at Richardson Stadium. I'm excited to share that in 2023, we will see the opening of the Lang Pavilion at Richardson Stadium. The pavilion will serve to enclose the north end of the stadium's bowl design and provide a new facility for student athletes, recreation programs, and our community. By closing off the current bowl, the Lang Pavilion is also expected to have a positive impact on sound mitigation. In addition, Queen's also employs several sound mitigation strategies to reduce the impact of sound on the surrounding neighbourhood, including a pre-approved maximum of acceptable sound levels at the stadium, which is actively monitored by staff, and the modern distributed sound system, which uses a greater number of speakers compared to other systems, will reduce the overall sound volume required uh, compared to the previous stadium structure. Queens did provide advance notice as well to our West Campus neighbours near the stadium in January, in, sorry, in February, advising them of our noise bylaw exemption request and welcomed any comments or feedback. 
We hope that City Council will contribute to see the benefits of the full application for community sponsored in Queen's events. Uh, many, many thanks for your consideration of this uh, request and I would be pleased to uh, answer any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you very much. Are there any questions from Council? Councillor Amos. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, through you. Um, your stadium sits in my district. <laughs> So I have a couple of questions in regards to, the, to your noise. When you say pre-approved sound levels, who's the pre-approval? Who's doing the pre-approval? Who's doing the, the pre-approval for the sound levels? Yeah, because yeah. you indicated in your presentation that the sound level is at a pre-approved level. Yep. Who's the expert that's giving that pre-approval? So we did a report, and I may ask Dwayne to step in as well. Um, we did a report previously that determined um, the sound levels that were acceptable. And the sound at the stadium obviously has some complexities to it, which can be tied to every, anything from kind of fan engagement, you know, how many people to the types of events um, that are happening. Um, but my understanding is the report previously helped us to determine um, levels of sound. In addition, we have um, some full-time staff that go around to actually monitor and assess um, the sound levels as well as part of that. Um, and I don't know, Dwayne, if you have additional comments based on the report. Yeah, the, the sound system itself was designed to um, funnel the sound directly into the stands, so uh, limiting the overflow outside of the stadium. I'm one of the people that Linda mentioned that goes around and monitors the sound outside. Uh, quite often, once the games are up and running, I'll be up by the, the turf field to the north, just making sure we're not getting any excessive sound outside of the event itself. The, uh, the pavilions, you said they will be in place for the, the football season, I'm assuming? Correct. Yeah. And I also noticed in the report that you're asking for a two-year exemption, and, and this is the first time Queen's has come forward with a two-year exemption. In the past, it's either been a year or a year and a half. Uh, and I'm, sorry, I'm asking multiple questions here. But, sure. Um, why, why the exception of going two years out now? And my, my last question is, uh, in, it indicates that community groups, you're, you're also lumping in community groups in this ask. Can you explain what some of those um, activities would be required or you're asking for on their behalf of what some of those sound activities would be? Sure, absolutely. I think I got three questions in there. So first, first, first one is uh, really excited about the pavilion opening in July. We're, we're anticipating uh, the opening um, in July, so having it fully open and functioning for uh, the season that will kick off, obviously, in, in August and September. Um, the, the request for the multi-year uh, sequential um, approval, um, the previous request was a sequential year. It was a, it was a two-year request. Um, so we're basically kind of replicating the request from the, the previous one. Um, and then the third question uh, that you asked around the support of community groups, um, we run events like um, for, for CASA, um, so, so football events at the stadium. Uh, for CASA, we have... Um, um, we've got... Don't want to jump in? Sure. <laughs> he books all our space. <laughs> um, yeah, we have events, and I've actually updated the website for the events this year yep. that we know about. Uh, things on the schedule this year are things like uh, Kingston Area Secondary School Athletic Association Championships, Eastern Ontario Secondary School Athletics Association Championships, um, Limestone Grenadiers Junior Football Club that will play their home games at Richardson this year. Uh, we have a U Sports National Women's Soccer Championship that's being hosted this year as a one-off event. Um, Junior Gales Soccer hosts the Gales Cup Tournament, which brings uh, numerous teams to the community in two weekends in July. So those, of, those types of events would be covered by this as well, instead of having to submit their own applications for their one-off events. The, the, Combined was actually a recommendation of staff when we did the two-year exemption back in 2021. Thank you. It's nice to see a uh, state-of-the-art facility being used by community groups as well. Yeah. It uh, shows the partnership that Queen's has with various athletics. Yeah. Thank you. And I, and I think as well, um, um, what's interesting is, is we're, um, we're looking at the opportunities as well to provide different um, types of activities that may be um, different and new as well um, and appeal to a broader user group.
through that space. So that's really exciting for us as well. Thank you, Councillor Bowman. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, uh, obviously we're the body that typically feels the complaints whenever there are any yeah. noise complaints. So I guess my first question would be, um, when you go around and actually do the sampling during an event, uh, yep. all that data is obviously recorded, and then is it posted somewhere that's freely available to the public so they can see what the numbers actually were that kind of coincide so that it's basically proof that it wasn't exceeded, or if it was exceeded, it was within these limits and for a certain duration of time. So is that information freely available and or put somewhere that public members could actually go and access it? Um, I'm gonna turn that over to Duane. I think you're asking for specific numerical um, sound check values. Currently it's not. Uh, it's not something that we post on our website for, for the public. Certainly something we could look at. Um, as Linda mentioned at the start, the sound levels change so much during the event, mm -hmm. depending on where people are sitting, et cetera. Um, so if we were going down that route, I think looking at uh, certain times during events would be something we would recommend instead of a constant throughout the event. Fair enough. And I guess as a follow-up to that, then uh, just because we are the ones that typically hear about it, um, would you be opposed or would there be an opportunity for members of the public that live near that area to actually, I guess, go with you or, or sort of attend and just sort of see what's done, just to build some faith in, in the system to see that, yeah, we are following with the rules. I just think it would create some good partnership between the community and Queens in that area for them to actually see the processes that you take. So is that maybe in a community outreach program that could be built into, into this going forward? Absolutely. I, I, think, um, I think sometimes just engaging in the conversation and sometimes, uh, you know, um, you end up being able to share different types of information or context or structure um, that maybe they didn't even fully understand or maybe we didn't fully understand. So um, I think that is one of the approaches that we are, are definitely taking with all of the activities that we do, not just specific okay. you know, to Richardson Stadium. Um, but quite often we need to educate each other mm -hmm. in, our, in our approaches and, and being able to ensure that we're able to um, you know, one, maximize op opportunities, but also capitalize on, on the partnerships and the relationships that we need to have within the Kingston community um, more broadly. So Excellent. absolutely. Glad to hear that's an option. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Shapes. Thank you. You mentioned during your presentation that uh, uh, you have certain protocols, or, or you mentioned that you went, went to the north to, to make sure the volume and also that you have a new sound system. I read some of the delegations that uh, the reports that came in, the letter from a, a, a resident yep. who mentioned was very loud. So I'm just wondering if you could confirm how new is this uh, new sound system and have you actually also gone to check these, the, the volume on the south side? Yeah. We do, uh, every year is just part of our No More Protocol, we do upgrades to our sound systems and we do assessments on our sound systems as well. With the pavilion coming online as well, we're looking at um, another review because there's a distribution, right, of sound and assessment as part of the pavilion um, coming online. Um, in regards to the specific letter that you are speaking to, um, that speaks to, I think, the level of amplified noise when you're sitting physically in the seat, right, in the event. Um, as well, and so it's it's how to it's how to kind of manage noise level throughout the event versus what's happening for the noise that's kind of outside the stadium as well. So I think there's two parts to that. Actually, I believe within that letter was both inside the stadium, stadium and outside. And outside the stadium. Yeah, and I don't think you answered the, in regards to the that the, the sound system. I'm sorry. The sound you system. You said it was new. So the, there will be new portions of the sound system with the pavilion put in place. Um, the existing, the, the portions of the sound system are when Richardson Stadium came online in 2016, um, but we do upgrades and checks with the sound system every year as part of our protocol. Okay, now you're also putting this in regards to- So Councillor Shaves, I'm sorry. So it's two question limit. Um, Councillor Amos was very creative and managed to cram three questions into one question. <laughs> It's the only way he was able to get around that, but it is two questions. I had two questions in one. This is my second so, one. So sorry, I gotta, gotta be consistent here. Uh, Councillor Glenn. I'm getting this personal. Uh, thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, so my first question is with regards to uh, the number of events held and when they're held. So uh, you've 
indicated in your report, you're looking at about 20 community events, 12 varsity games, potentially 15 multi-day events. So uh, how many events did you have uh, in 2022 and are they held on uh, weekdays or weekends? I will, in terms of total numbers, I might have to defer that to, uh, to Dwayne in terms of total numbers. I don't have the total number in my mind right now. Um, the varsity games was 11, I know that, and we hosted two playoff game, three playoff games. Um, the number of community events was lower in 2022 because of the pandemic and high school sports being uh, shortened seasons. Um, so I would guess, if I, were to put, if I were to guess on a number, I would say we were at a total of 25. We do, re we do report these monthly to the uh, city as well. Okay. And uh, what days of the week or weekend are most of your events? We are. Sorry. Uh, most of our varsity games are either Fridays or Saturdays. Um, the community events generally are through the week, through the day, uh, when high school students are in. Uh, we did have... Um, one weekend, or sorry, uh, the Ju Limestone Grenadiers football Saturday afternoons as well. Okay, thank you. Can I squeeze another? Uh, no, sorry, folks. I got to uh, got to be consistent here. Uh, Deputy Mayor Chinani. Uh, my question is uh, through you, Mayor. Um, I'm not. I don't think you said it in your report, but. Um, What's the percentage that you think that you're going to achieve in reduction of sound? Because um, I don't actually live that close to it, and I hear mm -hmm. it when you have events at my house. Um, not that I'm complaining, it's fine. But I um, just want to know what kind of percentage of reduction that you're, you're, you're expecting. Mm -hmm. um, with, the, with the pavilion, with the completion of the Yeah, pool? with your new sound system, with the pavilion, and mm -hmm. just so that, I don't know, I, I guess I'll be able to judge it by my, if I can hear it from my house or not. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're, we're hopeful for up to 15 to 20 percent, um, but we're not going to be able to fully be able to assess that, obviously, until um, until we put some activities in, in place. And again, part of the part of the noise mitigation is is the type of noise um, as well. And so um, a packed stadium may have less mitigation of noise than um, than than a practice that is that is requiring um, some some different types of noise levels. Thank you. Yeah, but we'd be happy to do an assessment um, to determine what that what that percentage change is as well. Um, more than happy to offer to do that. Okay, seeing no other questions, thank you both very much. Okay. Uh, with that, we'll move to our second and final delegation this evening. We'll invite uh, Megan Knott, Executive Director of Tourism Kingston, Mary Jo Currier, Executive Director of Downtown Kingston BIA, and Krista Leclerc, Executive Director of Kingston Accommodation Partners, who will appear before council to speak to clause one, report number 25 from the CAO, with respect to the patio program update, standards, application process, and fee review. Thank you, your worship and council. Um, I'm going to be talking about downtown Kingston patios or, 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 or all over the city patios, but I will be concentrating on downtown Kingston at first and then we'll move on to the citywide. Um, outdoor dining in downtown Kingston. As the region's leading culinary, entertainment, shopping and services destination, downtown Kingston has enjoyed many years of a vibrant outdoor patio culture that's second to none. There are an abundance of cafes, restaurants, rooftop patios, and bars in the downtown core, sorry, trying to, who have invested in the El Fresco experience. A positive effect of COVID-19 was the expansion of food and beverage onto the streets, literally, and a loosening of restrictions concerning alcohol, a reduction of red tape for the business owners. During the last three summers, business owners and the municipality have worked hard to keep everyone's safe as new, new outdoor spaces were experimented with. The new patio program that you have in front of you is a culmination of all that was learned to date in a citywide comprehensive guide for businesses who want to expand their space into the outdoors. The guide also helps standardize outdoor spaces while giving each business the freedom to be creative. 
Downtown Kingston has enjoyed, whoops, um, I'm just going to talk about some of the benefits for the city of Kingston. So benefits are more options for outdoor dining. This is with the guide that you have in front of you. Greater seating capacity and employment opportunities. More vibrant and attractive streets. Increased tourism and economic growth. Greater food, foot traffic near businesses and more active pedestrian uh, friendly spaces. So that's just for patios in general. When you look at the patio program or the patio guide, you'll notice that there are two types of patios. There's the sidewalk patios, which we're all comfortable with, fairly familiar with. The pop-up patios are a little bit different. They're the ones that came from um, our years in COVID. The impact to tourism is obvious, I think, for everybody to um, understand easily if you've spent any time in any of the uh, downtown cores across Ontario or Canada or Europe. That is a big part of the tourism experiences, uh, being out outdoors and being able to enjoy food and beverage. I, I don't want to take up any more of your time. I want to actually share um, the, the, the little bit of time I have with Shelby Gates, who's right behind me. She's the co-owner and operator of the Caesar Company, who just came in last year. 2021, they joined the downtown Kingston community and have really come in with a bang. They have a great patio, if you haven't tried it, great breakfast as well. So she's going to be talking just um, for a minute to you about patio impact. Thanks, Mary Jo. Thanks, Mayor. Thanks, Council, for having me. I just want to speak briefly to everyone. Given the rapidly increasing number of people that are choosing to go out for food and drinks than ever before, to someone with little to no experience in the hospitality industry, it would seem like business would be easy as ever. But with the peripheral service options like Uber Eats, drive through and fast food restaurants, a, and sheer number of options in Kingston leaves the restaurants continuing to ask the question as old as time, how do we generate new business? Outdoor seating not only offers a change of scenery for existing customers, but offers free exposure to pedestrians who get a glimpse of the restaurant service, food, and drinks. Patios also offer new landscape to the city, and in some cases, additional accessible seating. A patio offers auxiliary staffing for a restaurant, a new marketing tool, a way to get the most out of your building's capacity, and increase profits. Outdoor seating can certainly be of a paramount importance to a business like ours and every other small independent restaurant and chain or franchise in the city of Kingston. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any questions from council? Okay, uh, seeing none, thank you both very much. Okay, uh, we have no other delegations this evening, so we will move on to briefings. We do have one briefing. Uh, we invite Colin Wigginton, Director of Arts and Culture Services, and Megan Nod, Executive Director of Tourism Kingston, to brief Council on Information Report 1 with respect to the update and implementation of the Creative Industries Strategy. Mr. Wigginton. Thank you very much, Mayor Patterson, and I'm very pleased to be here this evening. I know you have a full agenda, and this is with regard to an information report that's coming out at the end of the evening, uh, but I do appreciate this opportunity to be able to highlight for you uh, the work that we're doing in our strategic role within Arts and Culture Services as a community cultural development agency. And it's particularly uh, a great thing that we're able to do when we're able to work with partners on this kind of endeavor. So I am joined this evening by Megan Knott, the Executive Director, Director of Tourism Kingston, but also here is Donna Gillespie, who's the Executive Director of Kingston Economic Development, our two key partners who are working with us on this initiative. So I just wanted to give you some highlight overviews of the work uh, to expand what's in the information report and to provide an opportunity to help answer questions should you have them. So just as a bit of a refresher, uh, creative industries falls within the larger envelope of creative economy. So those are knowledge-based endeavors, but in the case of creative industries, we're talking about content or services that are developed and delivered by artists and creatives. Uh, so it's a focus on creative and innovative content, but content that can then be monetized or leveraged for economic advantage. And not everyone is immediately familiar with what we are talking about when we say creative industries. So I just wanted to provide a bit of a highlight here that they do 
uh, fall into four major sectors, heritage, arts, media, and functional creations, of which they're subsectors. And I've intentionally highlighted here the ones that we're primarily focused on through the creative industries at this time. It's not to the exclusion of these other areas of endeavor, which we know to be very rich in Kingston as well, but there was opportunity through the work we did with the creative industry strategy to identify music, film, and theater as primary focuses of activity of uh, investment and development. I have actually highlighted here new media because something that is emerging already from the work that we're doing is this recognition of the intersection between these various forms of endeavor, but also their interconnections with new media in very many forms. So we are already having to have conversations about uh, investment and development around things like digital content creation, video gaming, uh, VR, XR, and uh, that kind of mixed reality work. So uh, that is an, an opportunity that's emerging at this time here in Kingston as well. I wanted to focus on this um, particular slide because this is work that's having global impacts. And a couple of the things that I wanted to highlight here that's unique to creative industries is the fact that more so than a lot of other sectors, it's one that is attractive and creates economic opportunity for young people uh, involved in the creation of content. Uh, and you know, as we think about issues like um, the climate emergency and climate change, it is a renewable resource. It's endlessly renewable, and it's something that isn't necessarily extractive or exploitive unless artists aren't being paid for their work, uh, but it is something that can continue to be replenished. And it's also interesting to note, as UNESCO has, that creative industries are often a gateway for uh, underrepresented groups to get a foothold into economic opportunities through the creation of work that they can then present and hopefully monetize. So I think that that's a, a key point to raise. I also wanted to highlight um, some data that we're recently able to tap into. We've been part of a partnership now for a number of years with a national organization called the Creative Cities Network of Canada. And through that relationship, we've been able to partner with Statistics Canada and Canadian Heritage to start developing uh, data at a local level, at, uh, at the Kingston level. And so I, the report highlights some of this data uh, that I wanted to reiterate here to show you that um, you know, creative industries in Ontario generates as much as $28.2 billion in, in revenue, of which Kingston's portion in 2020 was $181 million. So it represents 0.64% of the provincial GDP as it relates to culture. And similar to that, jobs. Uh, so we do uh, recognize almost 1,600 jobs in Kingston in 2020 related to uh, creative industries, which is a similar proportion of, of the Ontario equivalent. We're also tracking numbers uh, against national averages, but our partnership with creative industries allows us to look at it uh, across similar municipalities. So uh, the Kingston per capita in terms of cultural GDP is not at the national average, but it does exceed that of other comparable municipalities. We are lagging behind in terms of the income of artists and creatives, so that's definitely a target that we can focus, focus on to try and raise the bar in that area. Uh, so there are six main themes in the creative industry strategy, which is really the focus of the work that we're pursuing as arts and culture services with our key partners and, and our other partners. Uh, those are, are articulated in the report, so I won't go into them in depth, but everything is moving forward at the same time, and we're finding really great opportunities for intersections around this work. And of course, it is supported by enablers, and particularly enablers that we have uh, in abundance here in Kingston, which is the success we've seen around tourism, and also the, the prevalence of post-secondary institutions like Queens and St. Lawrence College. I just wanted to take a moment as well to talk about this kind of cycle of how this works. Uh, for arts and culture services, you know, we're very interested in the benefit that's accrued to artists and creatives locally. So they're identified in this pie chart as the people who are creating, producing, and distributing the content. But we also need people who are consuming that content, and that takes the form of residents and visitors, and that, of course, is a primary interest of organizations like Tourism Kingston, but we also then want to support, invest, and grow that endeavor. And that's where partnerships with organizations like Kingston Economic Development comes in, as well as other partners, including post-secondary institutions, but also industry partners, particularly in fields like film uh, production. So the more we can generate, the more there is to consume, the more benefit there are to artists and creatives, and you get the point. 
So already stated, we have these three key partners, but in more recent months, in 2022, we were able to establish a creative industries working group that uh, includes not only uh, Tourism Kingston and Kingston Economic Development, but also St. Lawrence College, which recently appointed a dean of creative industries. So there's great opportunity there with the, with the college. We're also working alongside Queen's University and their creative arts programs. And the Creative Industries Working Group also has representatives from those sectors, film, theater, and music particularly. As the report states, we're sort of looking at three phases of growth. We're in the early stages of the second phase. So we need to do this push to get things going initially. And phase three, obviously, is the marathon. It's the long haul. It's the making sure that we can continue to develop this on a strong foundation of collaboration, uh, which is immediately emerging uh, through all the different conversations and opportunities we have. So the three primary subsectors that we're focusing on right now, I just wanted to highlight those here. Uh, Tourism Kingston through film and media, their film and media department is really the lead on film. They have a film commissioner who's leading that work and a major focus is bringing in uh, productions to Kingston that can shoot here, but alongside that trying to and working very hard to develop that local workforce who in turn can also help to feed the development of a Kingston-based uh, film production uh, sector as well. Music at this point is, is being jointly led by Arts and Culture Services with a music strategy that we'll be bringing back to council later in the year uh, for your consideration. Uh, so we're doing that strategic sort of bringing everybody together kind of work and consulting with the community through public engagement. And uh, the Tourism Kingston through their music commissioner is doing more on the ground work right now through program opportunities, training and other efforts to help support musicians and music uh, sector locally. And then Arts and Culture Services is also working with the Kingston Theatre Alliance around the theatre piece. And this is where there's the most innovative work that's happening re remarkably here in Kingston, where there's people who are leading some very innovative digital-based theatre work uh, that's not only got garnering national attention, but international attention. And so we want to make sure that we are nurturing so the traditional forms of theatre, but also developing more innovative and new forms of theatre. So we do have mechanisms in place to measure the success that we're able to achieve through this that are economic, that are highlighted in your report and summarized here. And I just want to close by referencing the fact that we have a busy year ahead of us that we're already well into. There's a number of things that we're working on that are identified in Exhibit B of the information report, which is our 2023 work plan. And going forward, there will be opportunities uh, for you to continue to learn about the work that we're doing and the progress that's being made. Uh, we will be coming forward with more regular reporting through the Arts, Recreation, Community Policy Committee, which obviously will make its way up to Council. And you've also been seeing and will continue to see through the reporting that Tourism Kingston does and Economic Development does, this work reflected in their uh, reports that they share as well. So thank you. And I know that the clerk's office has shared this um, slide deck with you. There are some additional slides with more detailed information, particularly around the work that Tourism Kingston is doing and the work that Arts and Culture Services is doing related to theater. So happy to answer any questions you might have at this time. It looks like I made 10 seconds. <laughs> Very well done. Thank you. So that's great. Uh, are there any questions from Council? Council McLaren. Thank you. Um, I noticed there's no mention of comedians or comedy. Um, <laughs> have there been any um, organization coordination or partnership building with the co comedy community or uh, any resource sharing or is there anything that uh, can include them? There is absolutely space for, for comedy. Uh, as we've talked about in the past, it's very much a part of the Grand On Stage program. We do that, it is recognized as an important part of the performing arts. So we are anticipating through the Creative Industries Working Group that we're gonna expand those circles for greater conversation going forward so we can certainly be more intentional in terms of reaching out to uh, that sector here in Kingston, for sure. Great, so could they um, talk to you? Like, who should, whom should I recommend they contact if- They can uh, absolutely contact me. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, seeing no other questions, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, so with that, we will continue on in our agenda. Are there any petitions to present? Uh, seeing none, we have uh, no uh, special motions of congratulations or recognition. We have no deferred motions. So we will move to reports. Uh, first up, we have report number 24 from the CAO. 
Moved by Councillor Shave, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that report number 24 from the Chief Administrative Officer consent be received and adopted. And Councillor Ridge, you're excused for this item. Okay, so we just have the one item, request for extension of noise exemption, Queen's University, Richardson Stadium. Okay, we will call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, moving on to report number 25 from the CAO. Moved by Councillor Bohm, seconded by Deputy Mayor Chenani, that report number 25 from the Chief Administrative Officer recommend be received and adopted clause by clause. Okay, clause one, patio program update, standards, application process, and fee review. Okay, uh, we will call the vote on clause one. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, clause two, uh, housing accelerator, 900 Division Street and 33 Compton Street. All, Councillor Sanek? Thank you, Your Worship, uh, through you. Um, I just wondered for the one location that um, <laughs> when they sell or when we sell, it will um, be uh, specified that there should be five affordable housing units. I just wondered um, how five was picked. Um, you know, like why not six or seven? Um, why, why is it five affordable housing units? Mr. Ortograph. Thank you to you, Mayor Patterson. Um, we have looked at the um, kind of the, the ability for that site to uh, generate, obviously, uh, well, sorry, let me backtrack. There's a, there's a few reasons. First of all, um, this is a site that's already in um, an area where predominantly there are lower income affordable housing units in the neighborhood. So it's important to really look at kind of a, a complete community with mixed market housing options. So that was one kind of consideration. We also are looking at um, the feasibility of the project and the interest in the market and the ability to, to um, look at kind of the feasibility of the, um, the project as a whole. We also have identified uh, in the report that there's also an opportunity, should we have any um, income generated through this sale, that that would go into uh, other affordable housing investments. So really the combination of kind of doing some cost calculations of what would the cost be for those five units based on our, our kind of, based on the rental loss basically on, on affordable housing, the location and uh, the opportunity to also bring any additional income into a fund that we can then reinvest in other affordable housing developments. Thank you, and through you, Your Worship, um, a follow-up question. Then I know that, um, like you just said, that the money generated from selling these two um, properties will then go to buying um, land somewhere else in the city, right, to disperse. And I just wondered um, how soon we might be looking at, like, those other areas um, like, would we hope, like, if the, if the property sell quickly, would we hope um, it would already be, you know, like, sometime in 2023 or looking at 2024 uh, to bring them on? And um, if we actually have any sites in mind? I see your hurdle. Thank you, and uh, through Mr. Mayor. So, uh, Councillor Osenek, we already are working with a number of community agencies to find uh, properties that are located elsewhere within the city. Uh, we're trying to, of course, um, spread out our affordable housing units across the city. So we are already working with those agencies. You will see actually a report coming through to City Council most likely in April with some recommendations in terms of partnership with those community agencies. Thank you. Okay, we will call the vote on clause two. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Clause three, ice and sports field rates update. Councillor Glenn. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so a couple of quick questions here. Just with regards to the 10% um, capital surcharge, uh, could I please just have a, a brief explanation as to how that's being used? Uh, Ms. Turner. 
through you, Mayor Patterson. Thank you for the question, Councillor Glenn. Um, we have a 10% capital surcharge that we've had with ice rates for several years and then with the soccer rate or soccer field rates as well, or rectangular field rates, I should say, as well. Um, so what those are is that those fees are separated out um, and used for um, different things. So it could be anywhere from um, capital maintenance improvements, so reinvest, reinvestment into facilities. It could be purchasing a piece of equipment, specific piece of equipment that is needed, uh, things like that. Uh, thank you. So more specific to the ball diamonds, and particularly given that in 2024 we are hosting the um, Little League, Canadian National Little League Championships, um, are we doing upgrades uh, out of that money to the ball diamonds in the city? Ms. Turner. Through you, Mayor Patterson. So the, um, specifically to the 2024 uh, Little League uh, Championships, Council earmarked a year or two ago in the budget $750,000 for a renovation to the Cricket Field Diamond, um, which is located in front of the, the courthouse um, at City Park. Um, so that, uh, that renovation will be complete in 2023 and ready to go for 2024. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Amos. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, through you. Just following up on Councillor Glenn's uh, questions in regards to the 10% capital surcharge, what is the general state of our ball diamonds and our sport and our soccer fields um, as a whole? Ms. Turner? Through you, Mayor Patterson. Thank you, uh, Councillor Amos, for the question. I'm going to start, and then I believe Director Santucci from Public Works is with us this evening. So, um, Councillor Amos, several years ago, we had a um, consultant come in who did a turf care management plan for the city. We did do some work on our baseball diamonds and our soccer fields or our rectangular fields at that time. Uh, last week, during the budget process, Commissioner Joyce and Director Santucci had um, talked about uh, bringing back to committee and council an updated turf care management plan which would outline what the work would look like going forward for those facilities. And I'm not sure if Director Santucci wants to add anything to that. Santucci, go ahead. Yep. Um, yeah, so we, we are in the process of developing a new uh, turf care management plan. Uh, we have done some uh, more extensive soil testing on our all of our fields last year so that we can have a better idea of how to best treat those fields moving forward and developing a better plan for that. Um, so I, I, that is something that we will be bring, bringing forth um, to the committee and to council in, in May. I'm, con uh, <clears throat> I'm concerned with the state of our fields if we're getting reports back from our minor league groups that they are going out of town and enjoying state-of-the-art facilities and uh, coming back to using our fields and there's there seems to be a, a, a big discrepancy in uh, the state of our fields in comparison to out-of-town fields so I'm, I'm hoping this report uh, will offer a priority and then we can move forward in, in tackling our fields do we know the, the percentage rate of how active our ball diamonds are and how active our uh, soccer fields are? Ms. Turner? Through you, Mayor Patterson. Um, Councillor Ramos, I don't have the exact percentage, but what I can tell you is that they're heavily used, both our baseball diamonds um, and our soccer fields. I would say probably in the 80 to 85% range. We do carry a lot of sports tourism tournaments um, throughout the season, and we've also seen an increase, uh, especially in baseball. Um, so we have ebbs and flows, as you know, trends in different sports. And um, from what our groups are telling us, there is definitely an influx, especially at the younger age groups right now. Thank you. Okay, next is Councillor Sun. Thank you, Your Worship, uh, and, and through you. The, my question is uh, about the, again, the diamond field. Um, I just want to know, that, uh, what kind of a mechanism we have to uh, check 
that which field is, has been used and how many times it has been used effectively. Um, the one of the field I recognize, I used to live in the, that neighborhood, particularly in the Baxley Gate Park. I was there for 10 years. I never seen 10 years anybody playing even locally or any, any league up there. And I brought to this uh, um, director's, uh, Santusi's uh, attention when I uh, met with, with them. So how we can find out all the fields is been used and how much uh, how many feel we, we need to probably uh, reconsider if we need th those um, in place? Ms. Turner? Through you, Mayor Patterson. Uh, thank you, Councillor Hassan, for the question. So how we can tell the, um, the use per field is by because we, we permit the organization. So we have a sports field allocation policy. So what an organization has to do is they have to submit numbers um, to the city based on last year's registration so that we can get the initial allocation done. And then they submit revised numbers as the registration comes in um, so that we can see where, where the ebbs and flows are, the trends in the different sports. And then we adjust their allocation by that. Um, so that's permitted allocation. Then there is also what we call unpermitted allocation. So those are, the, those are people that just show up at the field or groups that show up at the field. That's a little bit more difficult for, for staff to track unless you know, we have um, a staff out and about who might see something. So Recreation and Leisure Services provides schedules to public works. Um, to Director Santucci's team, and then they know who, what groups are on what facilities at what time. Um, uh, do you have any idea that how much is cost per year to manage that one uh, particular uh, unused uh, so, diamond place? So, so Katsura Hassan, I'm just going to I'm just going to jump in just for a minute. So, so the item that's before us is with respect to the rates the user rates that we're going to approve for sports fields. So, so I'm just gonna ask people to tie their questions to that. I know there were a couple of questions about the capital surcharge, how that's used. I just wanna, I just wanna guard against going too much into the details about sports fields when we're just talking about the rates. I understand uh, your worship, but uh, I'm trying to find out how many fields we have which is not being used effectively and is costing the city to maintain those fields. Okay, is, is, there a, is there a quick answer from staff on that, Ms. Turner? Thank you, and through you, Mayor Patterson, um, what we can do is we can bring that back to the Arts, Recreation, and Community Policies Committee um, when we bring the update on the turf care management plan. Okay, that is great. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Sanek. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you, just a few questions. Uh, my first question is about... Um, the uh, soccer field. So, um, yeah, the soccer user groups with this new um, fee structuring, right? Uh, they get a windfall <laughs> because their prices are dropping, and uh, that's great. There'll be room, for to, uh, you know, for the coaches to bring in lots of extra oranges at halftime this year. But because um, our fees were so high, is this the first time that we've done a comparison with all the other, you know, comparator municipalities that? Our fees for soccer for you know the rectangular fields were so much higher than um, our comparators. Ms. Turner. Through you, Mayor Patterson. Thank you, Councillor Sonic, for the question. So um, we've actually been working on this project for a couple of years now. So we've we've done the comparator cities a couple of times uh, over um, and have known that they were high. But because of the pandemic at the time, we needed to focus on the pandemic and, and getting the groups through it. Um, and that was why we had come to the previous council for, for to freeze the rates hoping that we could get the groups through out the other side, then redo the rates, redo the comparator cities, and then that's the information that's before you this evening. Okay, thank you. Um, I know that the soccer groups, you know, appreciate that they're going to get um, um, a user fee reduction, that's for sure. Uh, they are a bit worried, though, that the maintenance will still, you know, they will still receive proper maintenance, even though the user, um, the rates are going down. So 
um, um, maybe when the turf management report um, comes, I'll just add in, right, that the goalie areas um, last year were really, really hard compared to other cities, and uh, the goalies were worried about getting injured, especially when they were at the goalie camps on our sports field. So sorry, <laughs> your worship, I'll just mention that in for when the uh, turf management report for the rectangular fields comes back to ARCP. So now I'll just go over to um, the baseball user fees. So they're going up, and um, I'm worried just about the timing. So I know that if we say the user rates go up, maybe like they're going to get the 10% capital surcharge, and then we can say that now it will be better maintenance, that sort of thing. But the rates, like <laughs> the registrations have already opened for the user groups. So I'm worried that since we're doing the increase for baseball right now, and you know some of the registrations are already full. Like I hear Kingston Thunder is basically already at maximum capacity, and and now like the the leagues are going to be making less money because more of the user fee will have to go to the city instead of buying you know doing the base linings and buying new bases and equipment that they have to supply because the city doesn't supply it. So, um, like. Uh, what do we say to the user groups with the timing? Like, I think this would be better if we were going to be increasing the rates next year since registration has already been underway open and in many cases already at maximum capacity. Ms. Turner. Through you, Mayor Patterson. Um, so, Councillor Osanic, this, this was a conversation with the groups over the last couple of years off and on, and this is why we had um, the conversations last fall with them and presented them with a, a slide deck as a follow-up for those organizations who, who couldn't be at the meeting because that was when they were starting to plan for the, the 2023 season. What has happened historically with the, the baseball and softball organizations is back in 2010, 2009, 2010, um, when everybody had come forward about the maintenance of, of city facilities in general, um, we uh, accelerated the sports field rates at that time, the rectangular rates uh, or field rates. Um, we were supposed to do the baseball diamond rates and um, baseball and softball wasn't quite ready at that point. So the council at the time had... Um, uh, basically put the brakes on that and that's why there's there's a bit of a catch-up here um, with baseball and softball but staff did have those conversations with the organizations over the last couple of years okay thank you um, I do want to um, propose an amendment and that's just to um, further get the conversation um, and kind of a, a referral over to arts recreation community policy so we're still voting on the user rates tonight, Your Worship. It's just adding these two extra clauses of uh, more work to do at Arts, Recreation, and Community Policy Committee. Okay, so so I'll just I'll just pause there. So we have a motion to amend, moved by Councillor Sen, seconded by Councillor Amos, uh, to add two clauses to the recommendations. The first clause would read that council directs staff to report back to the Arts, Recreation, and Community Policies Committee prior to the summer 2023, identifying sports field maintenance improvements that will be implemented in 2023. Uh, and then a second paragraph and that council directs staff to complete a service level review of maintenance for sports fields and report back to Arts, Recreation, Community Policies Committee in Q1 2024. Duly moved and seconded. The amendment is on the floor. Councilor Senate, you've, you've already spoken to it, but you have the floor if there's anything else you want to say. Right, thank you. Um, so just to elaborate on that, there's um, certain things that the uh, um, that the organizations, uh, you know, for baseball have to supply themselves. Um, they have to do their own line, um, lining the bases. They have to supply the bases. Um, like Kingston Thunder, they built the dugouts at Woodbine Field many years ago. They built bleachers at Woodbine Park years ago. Um, I think we just need to, um, to refer this to Arts Recreation to get a report from staff as to, um, you know, what capital improvement, like, you know, the maintenance improvements that um, city staff will make this year so that the clubs are really clear as to what um, they need to work on uh, for this year and also going forward. And, 
you know, if we're going to increase the user rates, you know, the parents and the clubs, they want to know what they, the benefit they get out of the user rates. And this report uh, going to uh, arts recreation should make that a lot more clear than um, what is, what I know is not so clear right now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there anybody who wishes to speak to the amendment? To the amendment, Councillor Bohm. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, uh, just basically where it says the, uh, can I see the wording again, please? Just wanted a clarification on the wording. Where it says service level review, is that gonna include uh, a baseline of the current status and like the plans as well to, to sort of repair them and, and perform reparations on them? CEO Hurdle. Thank you, Anne, through Mr. Mayor. So it would include the um, the current level that we provide, so detailed information on that. But it would also look at some of the best practices in other communities and to look at where there may be some gaps and where we may make some recommendations to make changes in terms of the service um, levels that we provide. Oh, okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, anybody else on the amendment? Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. We're back to the recommendation as amended. Councillor Senate, you still have the floor and you have one minute on the clock. Great. I just wanted to ask uh, the clerks if we could please separate the clauses, uh, or in particular just clause two when we do the vote there, because I think there's like four or five clauses in this recommendation. Yeah, no, when we get to the vote, just remind me and we can do separate votes. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, next is uh, Councillor Bohm. Okay, we're good. And Councillor McLaren. Thank you. Now, to throw in a little bit of a contrarian move here, um, I'm very much in favor of cost recovery, and I understand we're dropping the amount of cost recovery from 2022, but still above 2021 and before. Um, so I'm concerned that uh, this price drop hopefully will increase it, but overall I'm hoping that we can eventually get to like 50% cost recovery here because it strikes me that this is a pretty elite sports we're talking about here. And if you're playing this, we're essentially being subsidized by the rest of the taxpayers on this. Um, insofar as that's happening, there's a certain injustice there. So um, I realize that part of what we do is provide this stuff, so I'm okay with, with a little bit of subsidization, but I think uh, we should be moving more to full, or more at least, cost recovery. So I'm very happy to see that 3%, and I'm hoping that that grows at a faster rate than, say, inflation. Saying that, I did support the amendment because it is information, but I'm really hoping that um, we find a balance that allows us to lose less money on these things while still providing the service and encouraging perhaps the users to take a little more responsibility for their sport, uh, maybe building bleachers and stuff like that, or actually even painting the lines themselves. Um, I would just like to say that I would prefer a little more cost recovery rather than more subsidization by everybody. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next is Councillor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, based on the disrepair of our fields, uh, are there any concerns from a legal perspective or uh, about in, any injuries or have we ever had any legal proceedings based on the quality of our fields in the past? Ms. Morley? Thank you, and through your worship, I'm not aware of any previous legal proceedings um, involving the condition of our field. Certainly, we do have an obligation as the property owner inviting participants onto our property to ensure that they're reasonably safe while they're there. Councillor Tozo, you have the floor. No, thank you. Uh, and just to follow up, are we at all, uh, are, is there a large history of litigation with regards to sports fields for municipalities that you're aware of? Through your worship, uh, there is a significant body of case law involving personal injury on municipal parks, trails, um, and other facilities, yes. Okay, do we, do we have any idea of what kind of payouts there are based on these types of injuries? Just ballpark? No, no pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I, I too had to think about what that word was, but pay, payouts was the word I believe. Through your worship, thank you. I heard pants and I was very pants. confused there pants. for our moment. Um, I don't off the top of my have, head have any um, idea of what the average payout is for a liability claim. Um, they would certainly vary based on the injury that was sustained. 
Thank you, Counts. Uh, thank you, Solicitor. And that was a fault of my mic, and I didn't even intend to use the ballpark pun, but I guess that's where we are right now. Thank you very much for your questions. I have no further. Okay, anybody else? Okay, we'll call the vote on the recommendation as amended. All those in favor? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh yes, sorry, thank you. So we're separating uh, out paragraph two. So let's first do a vote on paragraph two. Okay, everyone's clear? So we'll do the vote on just in paragraph two. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries by vote of 12 to one. Uh, Councillor Sanic opposed. Now on the balance of the recommendation as amended. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, uh, moving on to report 26 from Planning Committee. Moved by Councillor McLaren, seconded by Councillor Osterhoff that report number 26 from the Planning Committee be received and adopted. Uh, there are two clauses. Would anyone like them separated? Uh, seeing none, we'll vote on them together. Clause one is approval of zoning bylaw amendment 2712 Quabbin Road. And number two, approval of zoning bylaw amendment 267 269 Earl Street. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Report 27 from Heritage Kingston. Moved by Councillor Glenn, seconded by Councillor Osterhoff, that report number 27 from Heritage Kingston be received and adopted. Would anyone like any of the clauses on this report separated? Seeing none, we'll vote on the report as a whole. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, moving right along. Report number 28 from the Administrative Policies Committee. Moved by Councillor Glenn, seconded by Councillor Ridge, that report number 28 from the Administrative Policies Committee be received and adopted. There are two clauses. Tax write-offs pursuant to the Municipal Act 2001 for February 2023. And two, 2023 tax ratios, tax capping parameters, and other property tax policy. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Report 29 from the Housing and Homelessness Advisory Committee. Moved by Councillor Tozo, seconded by Councillor Ridge, that Report 29 from the Housing and Homelessness Advisory Committee be received and adopted. There is just the one clause, Affordable Housing Program Updates, Kingston Frontenac Renovates, and Home Ownership. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Report 30 from the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Advisory Committee. Moved by Councillor Tozo, seconded by Councillor Osanic, that Report number 30 from the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Advisory Committee be received and adopted. Uh, Councillor Glenn will separate the two clauses. Uh, so the first clause is the 2023 committee work plan. Is that the one you wanted to speak to or is it the second? Okay, any other comments on clause one? Councillor Son? Thank you, Worship, and uh, through you, I just want um, <clears throat> a comment, it's not a question, basically. I just want to say thank you to the committee and uh, the EDI um, um, office uh, in the Kingston to setting up this three-year plan. I think this is the first time uh, in uh, it, that this plan has been established for three years. And it's a, I, I see that it's a very good plan. And I'm looking forward to uh, working together and make our city more diverse, equitable, and, and, and inclusive. And it's just a really uh, good news for King Kingston that we are moving into the right direction to making our city um, equal for everyone. Uh, thank you, Councillor Tozo. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. I'd also just like to highlight, uh, being a member of the EDI committee, of the impressive work that this multi-year work plan has been put for forward. I don't want to steal uh, Councillor Hassan's thunder, but I just want to echo the great work and the fact that this is the first time we've had a multi-year um, equi uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion plan um, and recognize uh, Mohammed as the member of staff who's really taken the lead on this initiative. And it's a really great committee and very collaborative, and I'm a, it's a pleasure to be on it. So. Uh, great work, everyone. Okay, thank you. We will call the vote on Clause 1. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. At Clause 2, Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Work Plan 2023-2026. Councillor Glenn. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through you. Um, so thank you very much for the work you're doing. Um, I think it's excellent that we finally have uh, a department or a committee, if you will, that's working on this. So um, one of my first questions is, 
uh, with regards to what's actually written here that um, you're going to go back and amend the work plan, is that correct? And what is exactly is being amended? Mr. Sun? Yes, it's correct. And uh, the reason why it's there is because sometimes uh, there is a pressing need according to the needs of the community. And like EDI uh, and accessibility and indigenization being uh, an ever-growing area, sometimes uh, uh, we cannot stick to the exact work plan. And like we have to go and uh, change uh, the direction based on the needs uh, of uh, the situation and time. Okay, thank you for that answer. Um, I'm hoping that you will also consider having a, a review of your plan. So I'm recognizing that uh, tomorrow is International Women's Day, morning purple. Um, <laughs> and I'm very grateful that uh, we as a city have recognized the day and we're going to be lighting up in purple tomorrow. Um, however, that being said, I'd like to encourage the uh, committee to use a more gendered lens to have a look at the feminist perspective a lot more. So the Canadian Human Rights Commission actually came out and um, clearly stated that the pandemic has had a far larger impact on women in our community. And they said that any recovery had to give a look at the feminist viewpoint. Um, the UN just came out and reported that it will be 300 more years before women achieve equality. So I'm really asking for the committee to go back and give a much deeper dive into that. I respect all of the other things that are there and the complexity of what we're asking you to do. But given that this is about 50% of the population and that this has been dragging on for a long time, this little girl who was really hoping to see that happen in her lifetime now knows that it won't. So that is my request to you that you will consider that. Mr. Sun. Mr. Mayor, through you, thank you very much for that comment. And uh, I would like to bring your attention to the uh, idea lens that is in this report uh, that focuses on the social equity and systemic change and intersectional approach. Uh, all these three items in the indigenization, uh, inclusion, diversity, equity, and inclusion lens uh, um, definitely covers the uh, gender inequalities and systemic barriers that prevent uh, uh, gender identities, uh, um, specifically uh, the, the feminine perspective from uh, becoming uh, not, if not equal, but equitable in more than um, many ways. And uh, this is the commitment that uh, from the EDI office we have made to the community and to the corporation that we will uh, review all our policies and procedures going forward through this lens. And that's not something that it's just from the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, but this is something that was endorsed by all directors, managers, and supervisors, uh, and of course, corporate management team uh, at uh, the corporation. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think what I'm really requesting is that you give more clarity to it and consider some specific initiatives. So for example, around this horseshoe, there are three women councillors. Um, you know, when we look at municipal politics, I think uh, we have opportunity to encourage more women to run. Out of the slate of 45 candidates in the last election, 12 were women. And there are obviously systemic barriers that are preventing women from putting their names forward. So I think it would be um, something I would, I would urge you to put into your work plan to work on something to encourage more participation in municipal politics by women. Uh, I think it's important that we start that leadership bid uh, right here in our own city. We're leading on so many other fronts, and I think this is another one that we have opportunity to take the lead on. So just more specific language. I think a lot of your initiatives have very clearly spelled out the target you're after. So I'd like to see a bit more specificity on that and maybe you know some targeted projects like that that are really designed to encourage and create that atmosphere for more women to be uh, participating at the municipal level. Uh, Mr. Sun. Thank you very much through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, I, I would just uh, like, first of all, uh, 
recognize that uh, this is definitely something uh, uh, highly important. Uh, but I also want to uh, lay out some of the specific items that are there in the work plan that focuses on uh, one of the most important one is the the youth fellowship program that uh, is uh, in in this uh, work plan that uh, will allow uh, the this council members to uh, mentor uh, a different demographic of youth uh, to be more involved in the municipal politics. And uh, once we will bring that uh, uh, structure of the plan forward, we will be asking all of the councillors to volunteer their time to uh, mentor uh, uh, youth from different demographics and specifically we will be focusing uh, the gender diversity as well as the the BIPOC community uh, uh, to bring more diverse voices uh, as part of the uh, the change in uh, this chamber as well as uh, on the whole as a corporation uh, another uh, one that uh, we, you will also notice that we are uh, also going to be working with our uh, HR and organizational development to increase the representation of uh, uh, women and uh, 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 BIPOC, which means black and indigenous and other uh, people of color communities uh, uh, at the corporation level, which is going to be more of a corporate goal that we want to achieve and, and see more representation at uh, that level as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you, I think you're going to uh Make good strides. Um, so my last sort of comment just has to do with accessibility and assistive devices that are noted in your, your work plan. And just that I would urge you to make sure that you consult externally with um, some experts. This is an area where there's a lot of movement to be made, having worked in it myself. Um, and one of the things that often happens when we try to achieve accessibility or put assistive devices in is it becomes very evident that we're doing it for a certain group of people. And that in and of itself creates a barrier for them. Um, right away, we're signaling that that person is different. Uh, so just I urge you to you know, really reach out, consult with some experts in this area. There's lots of great things going on out there that will allow us to increase accessibility, provide assistive devices without it looking like we're doing that. And that's a great win. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other questions from Council? Okay, we will call the vote on Clause 2. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, we have nothing from Committee of the Whole. Uh, we have one informational report, update and implementation of the Creative Industry Strategy. We have no information reports from members of Council. Miscellaneous business, we have a number of motions. Um, just a note that for miscellaneous motion number 2, uh, Councillor Stephen is not here. Could I have a volunteer to put their name forward to move motion number two? Moved by Councillor Sun. Thank you. Okay, so uh, number one, moved by Councillor Shave, seconded by Councillor Osterhoff, that David Arnott be affirmed as the Ministry of Environment, Conservation, and Parks representative of the Kingston Environmental Advisory Forum, appointed for a term ending November 14th, 2026. Number two, moved by Councillor Sun, seconded by Councillor Amos, that is requested by Carol Ann Hoyt. Uh, Canadian Children's Book Centre, City Council proclaimed November 8th, 2023 as I Read Canadian Day in the City of Kingston. Number three, moved by Councillor Glenn, seconded by Councillor Tozo, that is requested by John Casting. City Council proclaimed March 13th, 2023 as uh, Shaharshanabi Suri in the City of Kingston. Number four, moved by Councillor Ridge, seconded by Councillor Bohm, that is requested by John Casting. City Council proclaimed March 21st as Nauras in the City of Kingston. Number five, moved by Council McLaren, seconded by Council Hassan, that notwithstanding section 3.1.4, subsection five of the first capital place illumination policy, Council approved the application submitted by Sabina Islam, Islamic Society of Kingston, for the illumination of City, Council, uh, City Hall on Springer Market Square on March 15th, 2023, for United Nations International Day to Combat Islamophobia. Uh, number six, moved by Councillor Glenn, seconded by Councillor Ridge, that the resignation of Kathleen Hamilton from the Kingston Frontenac Public Library Board be received with regret, and that in accordance with section 3.3.2D of the public appointment policy, Jane Kingsland be appointed from the reserve pool to the Kingston Frontenac Public Library Board for a term ending November 14th, 2026. Okay, we will call the vote on those six miscellaneous motions. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. 
Okay, we have uh, no new motions. We do have one notice of motion. Uh, Councillor Bohm, did you want to read the notice, notice of motion into the record? I certainly can. Okay. Moved by Councillor Bohm, seconded by Mayor Patterson, whereas Council approved the draft plan of subdivision for 998 Highway 15 on September 20th, 2022, which contained a condition requiring the owner to design and construct a signaled intersection at Highway 15 and Street A as part of the first phase of the development. Whereas the Highway 15 Municipal Class Environmental Assessment that was paused in March 2020 had not yet evaluated the appropriate intersection design for the 998 Highway 15 subdivision, including whether a roundabout would be feasible and move a signaled intersection. Whereas the city intends to restart and complete the Class EA now that the Waban crossing is complete, whereas the construction of the signal intersection at the subdivision entrance is not required until build out of the subdivision development, which is anticipated to occur after completion of the Class EA. Whereas the city's transportation services department and the owner are agreeable to the city assuming responsibility for the design and construction of the intersection improvements at Highway 15 and Street 8 in accordance with the recommendations of the Class EA, subject to the owner making a financial contribution equivalent to the cost of constructing the signal intersection that was contemplated in the original conditions of draft plan approval. Whereas subsection 51, uh, bracket 44 and bracket of the Planning Act states that the approval authority may change the conditions of a draft plan of subdivision approval at any time before the approval of the final plan of subdivision. Therefore, be it resolved that the notice of decision of application for approval of draft plan of subdivision for 998 Highway 15 be amended by deleting conditions 10B and 10C of the conditions of draft plan approval and replacing them with the following. B, prior to final plan approval, the owner shall pay to the city by certified check or bank draft an amount equivalent to the cost of constructing a signaled intersection at Highway 15 and Street A as determined by the city's third party engineer, the owner's contribution, to be applied toward the city's cost of designing and installing intersection improvements at Highway 15 and Street A. It being acknowledged by the owner that the intersection design will be determined by the city based on the recommendations of the Highway 15 Municipal Class Environmental Assessment, which may include a signaled intersection, a roundabout, or such other designs determined by the city. The parties agree that the owner's contribution will not exceed the sum of $375,000 plus HST. C, the owner may proceed to construction via a pre-servicing agreement once on-site engineering drawings are approved, regardless of the status of the Highway 15 intersection design and or Highway 15 municipal class environmental assessment. The city will not delay the issuance and approval of the pre-servicing agreement or final approval of the subdivision agreement or issuance of preliminary certificate of underground services while the final intersection of Highway 15 design are determined per clause 10B. In the interim, while the city undertakes the Highway 15 and Street A intersection design, Street A will terminate at the existing Highway 15 edge of payment and no modifications to Highway 15 will be required excluding any required regulatory signage or line painting, and that planning services staff be directed to provide notice of the change of conditions in the prescribed manner pursuant to subsection 5145 of the Planning Act. Okay, thank you very much. Read into the record and uh, it will appear as a new motion at our next meeting. Okay, um, with that, uh, Madam Acting Clerk, I will ask four minutes, please. Moved by Councillor Boehm, seconded by Councillor Amos, that the minutes of City Council meeting number 9-2023, held Tuesday, February 7th, 2023, be confirmed. All those in favour? Opposed? And that's carried. We have some tabling of documents, a number of communications. Is there any other business? Councillor Amos? Thank you, Mayor Patterson, through you. Uh, just a small reminder that uh, March break is coming up, and I want to thank my fellow councillors in pitching in and uh, doing this as a group. Uh, we have sponsored uh, some free ice time for Kingston residents that will take place on Wednesday, March 15th, from 1 to 4 at the Kingston Memorial Centre. And uh, you can reserve spots uh, online through the cityofkingston.ca play site, or you can uh, visit an uh, administrative desk at one of the city's Kingston Recreation Facilities. And once again, thanks to our city councillors for pitching in on this. This is not coming out of taxpayers' monies. This is coming out of uh, council's own pocket uh, to allow Kingston residents to enjoy something for free over the March break. Excellent. Thank you, Councillor Amos, and uh, all the councillors that have uh, put that forward. That's excellent. Okay. Uh, with that, I will ask for a motion to adjourn, please. Moved by Deputy... Oh, bylaws, yeah. We probably should pass those, shouldn't we? Um, Madam Acting Clerk, bylaws, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, moved by Deputy Mayor Chinani, seconded by Councillor Hassan, that bylaws 1 through 13 be given their first and second reading. All those in favour? Opposed? And that's carried. Moved by Deputy Mayor Chinani, seconded by Councillor Hassan, that... Clause 12.63 of bylaw number 2021-41 be suspended for the purpose of giving bylaws one through four three readings. 
All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. And finally moved by Deputy Mayor Chenani, seconded by Councillor Hassan, that bylaws one through four, six, seven, and nine through 13 be given their third reading. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Motion to adjourn. Moved by Deputy Mayor Chenani, seconded by Councillor McLaren. All those in favor? Opposed? And we're adjourned. Thank you very much.